Well, I'm sitting here anxious because I'm speaking with literally the best and brightest. Literally, name that twice, Paul Marabella. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Won that award. Thank you, EB. The cards are a little stacked against me, Paul. I, know. I was young when I won those awards, though. <laughs> <laughs> it was a long time ago. <laughs> okay. Well, now it's even worse because now your formal title is Chairman and CEO of Havas Creative North America. Yikes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, that, by the way, here's the formal part still. That includes you head up three creative networks that make up that group, Havas, Arnold, and Annex. Right. You've got like more than a thousand creatives under those robes. Right. And I'm going to give a little bio about you. Please. Okay. Your first Tavas gig was to lead the first party data CRM practice in North America. Then you helped transform the Havas Chicago Creative Agency, where you were CEO. You co-founded the Global Culture and Entertainment Network of Annex, which we're going to talk about. Yep. And before all of that, you tackled creative business model innovation Digital transformation assignments at Accenture's interactive agency, Wirestone, right? That's correct. Oh, my gosh, yeah. Paul. Oh. And on top of that, you help at-risk children. Right. How can I keep right. going? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I'll tell you how we're going to keep going. We're going to get some insights with Paul Marabella, the chairman and CEO of Havas Creative North America. All right. Happy to do it. Hey, it's E.B. Moss, Head of Content Strategy for Media Village, and I have a very big guest with me today. I have Paul Marabella, who is the Chairman and CEO of Havas North America, and we are going to talk about a ton of stuff, everything from how they've innovated around creativity and empowered their entire organization to contribute good ideas to how CMOs have to grapple with the future to the place for data in today's ad industry. We're going to get some insights in Insider Insights from Media Village. Paul Marabella, we kind of got the formal bio out of the way, but I know I interviewed an executive coach in one of my last episodes, and she said that everyone's supposed to have one of those, like, pithy personal mission statements, right? <laughs> and I read the first line of your description on LinkedIn. Okay. So, so this is it. I'm reading. Okay. A creative business executive energized by breaking traditions in industries ripe for disruption. Wow. Right. I love that yeah. line. So basically, you get really psyched by breaking things down and then reinventing them? Yeah, I think it's uh, everything else is boring to me. I mean, I, my wife likes to say I have a hero complex. and uh, But uh, for me, I think it's really interesting to find challenges where you can uh, take the great work that people have done before you and, and take it to the next level. And I think that's been a big part of my career and things that I've done. So I think that a good example might be based off of something that we have in common. Mm which is the village concept, yeah, all right? right? Right, So I am with Media Village, <laughs> and we aim to be a community for media marketing, advertising, everybody brought together by thought leadership and insights. Now, your villages were kind of started when you were transforming Havas Chicago, as I mentioned in, in the intro, when you were CEO there. But describe your villages and how they sure. came about, the what and the why. Sure. Uh, so I have to give Yannick Bolare the credit on, on the village concept and Unique's the chairman of our company globally. And one of the things that he recognized pretty early on was that marketers and brands today struggle with disparate capabilities. And what's really interesting about that is I've been in this business long enough to have gone through the bundling and unbundling conversation mm -hmm. probably three or four times. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that our take on it is when you have a group of people that are hiving around a particular brand's challenge and put that brand's data and opportunity both in macro and micro sense and you have those people working together living together and building the brand together the client wins and for us that's the idea of a village and it started with creative and development and media but it's it's gone into other areas like pr mm -hmm. and crm and experiential and Latino and Hispanic with a, a new group that we bought late last year. Mm -hmm. 
again, it's a really powerful thing for a brand to have all of those people hiving and solving those challenges that, that change every day. So that's interesting because I know that part of the issue that's going on in the industry today is it's actually a really big question. There have been a lot of acquisitions lately. I mean, right. you were at Accenture mm-hmm. or a division of, and they recently acquired Droga 5. Right. Publicis acquired data giant Epsilon. And, and so I see that, well, the big question is, is there a future for creativity on its own? Or is the trend of pairing creative really the way of the foreseeable future? And is everything about the breaking down of the silos? So you have your villages where you've broken down the roles and responsibility kind of silo. And now we have the whole industry kind of merging together. Right. Tell me a little bit more about that. I think that everybody's trying to find the answer. I'm not sure anybody has the answer yet. And I think it's interesting. I was having a conversation with our global CEO recently about when Accenture makes a move, everybody lauds it like it's hmm. like it's gospel because it's Accenture. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's the right move, right? And, and I, I certainly respect a move that an organization like that makes, but I think there's a lot of other great companies that are making deals and doing some interesting things that maybe fly under the radar and maybe not getting the headlines that that Accenture gets. And I think that I was excited to see Droga get purchased by Accenture. I have tremendous respect for Droga as a, as a creative agency. Uh-huh. Tremendous respect for Accenture in, in the work that they're doing around experiences and, 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 and building digital experiences. But as a creative, it was really interesting to have a creative agency being a part of of Accenture. I say score one for creativity. And we talk about how that culture will integrate into Accenture. And I think that's a fair question. I'm sure Brian Whipple and and, and the executives at Accenture are are trying to figure that out as well. And I would imagine a lot of the creatives at Droga are asking themselves that same question. Maybe, Maybe they don't have to integrate. Maybe they're a part of the brand's journey. And when the brand's journey calls for creativity, Droga gets the phone call. Well, that's interesting, and, and that sort of fits in with, with your brand position personally as an optimist, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't really thought about creativity being the sort of lead dog. I, I keep thinking with my negativity that data is going to just subsume everything and, and creativity will suffer. Yeah. But you see the data being an asset to creativity and creativity being the hero, so to speak. I think creative people and creative, let's just say agencies for the sake of the discussion, are very resilient. I mean, they've survived for 100 years through all types of people talking about how they're going to change or they're going to die. And I'm old enough to be have lived here in New York City in the mid-90s and have been part of the digital revolution, yeah. which I'm, I think we're still waiting to happen now, <laughs> and the same conversations are still being had. But the same conversation happened in 1995, that the creative agency was, gonna, was, was going away because digital was going to overtake true creativity and true idea development. I remember those conversations. So you don't think that it's an issue for creativity to stand on its own? You don't think that a collaboration is required in today's environment? No, I, I, I absolutely think collaboration is more powerful mm-hmm. when, when it's a part of, because when you look at a, a global brand or even just a large brand, it's complex. How that brand connects with its buyers, whether it's a B2B buyer or a B2C buyer, is complex and it changes every day and, and, it's, and it's fragmented. And the decision makers on that brand have to use all of the different weapons at their disposal with a limited finite budget. Mm-hmm. No matter how big the budget is, it's still a finite, still a finite budget. And when creativity, when a really, really powerful idea is developed, which we talk about it at Can a lot, right? But that's not that's not those aren't the only amazing ideas that exist are the ones that we celebrate at Can. Mm-hmm. You have a multiplier effect, I would say, on the impact on that particular brand in that business. But when that idea is then carried through the entire customer journey, it's even more powerful. And that particular agency that developed that creative idea might not be the right one 
to carry it through the entire customer journey. Whether okay. That's, whether that's a digital experience or whether that's a physical experience. Um, but they can certainly collaborate with the best of breed experts to be able to do that. So there's still room for the big idea, the, the kind of mad men storyboarded pitch. And if it's a big enough idea, then what I think I hear you saying is that it'll have legs that work across all of the, the platforms and incarnations and, and necessary versioning sure. of that idea? Sure. I mean, I, I, I think that the even, you know, mad men are not mad men, but sometimes the simplest ideas are the, are the ideas that win, and sometimes they don't cost any money. The TD Ameritrade ad that we've with perfect the, tee up. Yeah, I love that. The, the you know it's it's almost a year old now because it was just over a year old because it, it won it at it was a titanium finalist at Cannes last year. This is actually one of my favorite ideas, so yeah. I want you to describe okay. it. Yeah, go ahead. So the idea was to have the first ad in the blockchain, mm -hmm. and and when you think of a brand like TD Ameritrade and the amazing work that Denise and the team there have been doing. I applaud them for buying an idea like that, which was, we like to say it cost $24, really, at the end <laughs> of the day. But we had to, the creativity in it was to think of that, but also figure out how to do it. And, and we have some folks in our New York agency that figure out how to hack the blockchain and how to have <laughs> that particular ad, which was basically a TD Ameritrade flag that will forever be in the blockchain. We used, you know, different media, whether that's mm -hmm. earned media like PR or uh, other media like paid to drive awareness of the fact that we actually did that. So there was a, an integrated strategy around it. But again, it was a simple idea. It was based on a really simple insight. And, and we drove it through the chain. And, you know, TD Ameritrade's having, not necessarily because of that particular ad, but they're, you know, they're having some success because of, the, I would say, their courage and creativity. So really, it also is representative of the perfect combination between creative and and tech. That's so right. To speak. Yeah, that's a good yeah, point. Yeah, yep. it's just so cool. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about the the atmosphere that led to that kind of creative thinking okay. at Havas. I think that the the village concept is one where you know if you, if it is a, a perfect marriage of tech and creative, mm -hmm. and then the media folks come in because you said that the idea was spread across multiple mm -hmm. platforms. I mean, you're really fostering an environment where everybody participates. Right. Is is that like your mo there? Right. I think that's a I think that's a fair assessment. I I, I think it's maybe less about everybody participates and more about bringing the right people on to the challenge. Right. Uh -huh. Every brand is different that we have in the mix. Sometimes we have a CPG brand that does not sell direct to the consumer, so they don't have the consumer data. And sometimes we have a retailer or an insurance company that does have the consumer data, first party data. So it allows you to do some different things. And frankly, I'd say the CPG challenge is a harder one because they don't have the first party data. Mm -hmm. So how do you make decisions on who to target, when to target? You're using second and third party data to make some some decisions and but you can do really amazing creative for a beer mm -hmm. or you know uh, other types of CPG brands but you can do amazing creative for an insurance company too like we do for Progressive our Arnold agency does incredible work for Jeff Charney and his team at Progressive yes. and and there's always something new right. to see with, right. with the Progressive team and I think that's that's an example of a collaboration with a client that is has courage and creativity and really pushes his creative partners to be good at what they're at and and really push them for bigger ideas. Well, one of the things that you also say is important to you is to create meaningful brands and have a relationship-based campaign and and strive for the connection between connections and between brands and the consumer. Right. I want to hear more about the Havas philosophy, okay. the mission, and that meaningful brand's stance. How does that live sure. in today's world? Yeah, meaningfulness is an important topic for us, and it actually comes straight from the top. And when, when you work for a guy like Unique Bolare, who cares deeply about the work that we're doing, but also cares deeply about I mean, having an impact on, on work in society and, and on a global level, it, it came naturally to us. And for the last 10 years, we have developed a research study with over 350,000 people globally 
that we call the Meaningful Brands Research. And it really is the, the genesis and sort of the basis of our global positioning, which is to make a meaningful difference to the brands, businesses, and people that we work with. That's our global positioning that we rolled out at the beginning of this year when we were in Barcelona. Yannick rolled it out to the organization and we're starting to integrate that into our into our work. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you're only going to do cause-related campaigns. Although you do that pretty well, too. And we do do a good job at that. And I'll have to shout out our host of us team in Australia for yeah. the Palau Pledge work that, that they've done over the last 18 months, which I think may go down as one of the most awarded campaigns mm. in recent history, if not history. Mm -hmm. But also a brand that has utility can also be, also have a meaningful positioning as well. And I think a big part of that is to find where it, where it could. But what's an example? So when you think about, there are three, there are three aspects to meaningfulness when we, when we do our, our work. And when you look at some of the brands that are, that are, are really leading the way, there's the rational side of, of meaningfulness is, is does the product work? Does it does it do what it says it, it's going to do and do it mm -hmm. well? The personal side of it is that what are the personal benefits to me and does it improve my life on a personal level? And then the collective benefits. Does the product care about the collective in society? So when you think about a brand like Johnson & Johnson that scores you know, fairly high on, on all accounts mm -hmm. as a master brand, they they care about people's health and they go out and talk about that. When you think about a brand like CVS that talks about we care about people's health enough to make key decisions as it relates to our revenue, our own revenue and product assortment that we might have in the store and the, and the companies that we buy to be a part of our value chain. Those are the brands that are scoring high on, uh, from a meaningful perspective. But I can give you one that maybe... Maybe that uh, you wouldn't expect, which is a brand called KY, which is owned by Reckitt Benkiza, one of mm -hmm. our clients. And KY decided that they were going to bring a conversation out into the open, which was you know female sexual health. Mm -hmm. And to have a conversation, open conversation about that. And our Havas New York team done an amazing job this year on, on creating content and having real conversations and real dialogue about raising the quotient on that conversation and that's a brand like KY right. that, that you wouldn't expect would take that position. That is an example of meaningfulness and, and taking a product that has utility, but turning the, the people in that organization have decided that they want to have a higher level conversation than just sell more of their product. Yay. Love that. Yep. And it's so important in today's environment, too, where it's kind of a, a cynical environment, right. if you will, a cynical time. And so trust is such a valuable commodity. Right. And it seems like meaning probably helps infuse some brands with with trust, if you can relate to it. Purpose. Yep. And how are your creatives or your creators mm -hmm. responding and, and applying that kind of top-down sentiment? That's a great question. I, I think that they have really latched on to the mission and vision of, of our organization on multiple levels, and especially the, from the meaningfulness perspective. One campaign that happened over the last six months with our Chicago team, again, for a durable good brand called Moen, which makes the, the number one manufacturer of water faucets. Uh-huh. But Just beautiful ones. Beautiful ones, very beautiful <laughs> ones, the most beautiful ones, uh, decided that they wanted to have a higher level discussion around water. And the creative, that was the brief. Mm -hmm. And the creative team on that business really came to the table with some amazing ideas around how the, the design for beautiful water, a beautiful design for beautiful water, and then had an idea about if we're going to stand for beautiful water, what if, what if we had a chief water officer? So what, what if we had a water director? And Moen went out and did a public search and found a really incredible woman to be their chief water officer, a double major from MIT, hmm. to help them understand the impact, both positive and negative, that water has collectively in our society and personally as well. And it's really started to create a filter for them on product development on acquisitions, and they, they have a new product called Flow by Moen, which is helping people. It's a very simple product, but effective, which helps you measure water 
consumption in Ooh, your home. If, if, if you have a leak somewhere in your home, it helps you find it because that's it's about wasting water. It's, yes. about, it's about water consumption and it isn't just about faucets anymore. Oh, uh, okay. There's the meaningful difference. Okay. <laughs> now I want to go buy a mowing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I might know somebody. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so are you finding that this type of attitude is helping you attract and retain a strong talent pool? What's competitive out there today? It is for, competitive. For, for, strong, for strong talent. Yep. And, and certainly it's a priority for me. I, I spend a good portion of each day of every week on talent discussions. And that's either from a recruiting perspective at all levels of the organization or diversity and inclusion is, is a big priority for, mm -hmm. for us globally and, and here in North America especially. And we, we are always looking for the edge as it relates to the meaningful discussion around somebody coming to work with us versus our, our competition. And certainly I think our positioning is taking hold as it relates to if all things, all else being equal, would you choose one holding company or right. one ad agency over us? I think you might, that is a tipping point for, for a lot, especially the younger generation, which right. uh, when you look at the data, meaningfulness and purpose way over indexes the younger, I mean, the, yes. younger, the younger in the working class. I mean, that's yes. that's not revolutionary data, but it, it does exist and it, and it it is real. In 2017, actually, you were quoted by saying that you were flipping the pyramid, allowing creators to talk with CMOs, communicate with CEOs, and converse with clients. And it seems to me that that younger generation is really all about feeling empowered and feeling like their voice matters. Right. So has that been working out? Yeah, it actually comes from an interesting place. Because you, you are the CEO. I so, am. You know. I am. <laughs> I, I'm still young. Okay. That point of view comes from an interesting place is that in my 20s, when I was on, on my way up, the gentleman that I worked for let me have access to, mm. to the clients. Mm -hmm. and, and I feel like I certainly, I'm sure I made many mistakes along the way and was in, indefinitely as, as I was learning the game. But I, I did. I thought it was. I thought it was. It was always crazy that companies and, and agencies specifically wouldn't allow some of their brightest young minds to be in the room. You know how do they say it in Hamilton? Be in the room when it happens. Yeah. And 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 they wouldn't allow them to be in the room when it happens. And and I think that one one thing I know for sure is that we certainly allow and 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 welcome and encourage our youngest talent to be in the room when it happens. And it's, I would imagine it's scary and, <laughs> and, 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 and you, but you learn quicker uh -huh. that way. Even, even if you don't have a huge role, you see the types of questions that clients ask, you see how the more experienced yeah. folks deal with it. I mean, you're in the game and, and we have really incredible, you know, executives in our organization uh, in, in different offices that maybe wouldn't have gotten a chance yep. 20 years ago yep. for a variety of reasons. But now do now do have the chance and and have accelerated and those are typically the most curious, um, mm -hmm. most you know I would say high degree of humility and hunger. Yeah, those are the people that do the, do the best at, at our organization. I love that, and and that's also where your village is, so to speak, and the media village. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> have yeah. something in common. Yeah. our our founder Jack Myers very much believes in throwing are fresh out of college hires into the deep end sure. and allowing them to to right. figure out how to swim. And I'm telling you, it's been great every time. So yeah. I, I think that's great. I'm glad Thank to see you. that is beyond Media Thank Village. <laughs> Um, and and I also know that personally that DNI is a big part of your DNA. I of course interviewed Karen Smith, yeah. who is the relatively new CEO mm -hmm. of Arnold, who came up through the marketing ranks. She was in. I'll give a plug. <laughs> episode twenty three of Insider <laughs> Insights. <laughs> and then of course you just hired another female CEO mm -hmm. in Havas, Canada, Canada right? And then Laura Manis is CEO of Havas Group in New York. So, right. yay to the women CEO yeah. power! Thank you, Pa. <laughs> That's great. What else are you doing in in that realm? Well, we'll start globally. I mean, we. Our, our global team, Patty Clark's our global head of talent, and she is a great partner to me as it relates to programming around diversity and inclusion on the global level and the North American level. We have a program called Fem Forward mm -hmm. that Patty and her team 
concepted and launched globally. And for us, it's about giving. Uh, we re, we did we did a study of our executives globally and realized that we were that women in our organization were being promoted through the organization, but they were hitting as oh, as they got the to proverbial mi- glass ceiling. As they got to middle management into executive management, they weren't for whatever reason making that move mm. into the organization. But we knew that there were women in senior leadership roles in our organization. We do have work to do in our creative teams, and we can talk about that in, in, in a minute. So we, you know, Patty and her team dug into why. Is it a resource issue? Mm-hmm. Is it a training issue? Is it a confidence issue? Is it a, what, what are the things that, that our organization feels like are holding the women back from moving to the next level and built a whole program around the feedback that they had gotten? So we nominate, in fact, I just got the email this morning for the next round. Uh, it, it, we email, we send women all around the world to, to be a part of, of this training program that Patty puts together and, and, and I can, safe to say that many of them have already been promoted up into the organization. You know, it's interesting. You you mentioned our CEOs on the creative side of the business. And by the way, there are many others. I mean, Donna Murphy mm-hmm. is is the a global CEO of Havas Health and You, and she's an incredible leader and built an amazing organization. And we have, it seems like women in some very important CEO roles in our company. And, you know, people ask me, did, did you do it intentionally on the uh, in the organization that I lead? And the answer was, for a long time, I, it was, I never... It wasn't a conscious choice. They were the best people mm-hmm. for the job. Good answer. And, and now, now over the last couple of years, has been more certainly been more focused on that. But my, for me, it hasn't changed as it relates to hiring the best people for mm-hmm. that particular job. On the creative side, we do need, and I think all the agencies need, yes. need help there. And it, it, that it, that is a place where I'm focused and trying to think about how we can attract senior female creative leaders that were are right for the roles that we have in our organization. Yeah. And that's um it's sort of systemic to the industry overall. You know, there was the the A and A survey of its member companies and even of themselves right. about their D and I practices. But right. certainly with creative or or even data scientists, the whole yep. need that's to true. empower and educate girls and have them embrace coding, for right. example. It's, right. it's just pervasive and it's a domino effect, but I'm glad to hear that may the best woman win, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> at least in your space. Mm-hmm. I want to talk uh, about some other innovative stuff that you do because I, I really do feel that, you know, you walk, is it walk the walk, walk the talk? Uh, I always mix it up, yeah, but you're, you're doing that, trying to make a yeah. meaningful difference, not just with the brands, but you also talk about that with the people you work with, which we mentioned, and, and you know, how you conduct the business. So I'm kind of fascinated by Annex. Okay. What, yeah, let's talk about it. Discuss. <clears throat> when you work in an organization like Havas, I think one of the things about Havas that's different, and I have many executive level friends in our competitive set, so I can say this with some degree of, of, of confidence. When you work for a person like Yannick and the people that he surrounds himself with, trying new things is encouraged. And, and being entrepreneurial, and if you have an idea, pitch the idea, try the idea, build the idea, see what happens. And, and that's one of the most exciting things. For me, one of the most exciting parts about being part of Havas and mm-hmm. Vivendi, which mm-hmm. is also also a discussion to have around one of the most creative companies in the world in Vivendi. And about three, three and a half years ago, my then partner and I at the time realized that there was a gap in, in what was happening. And a lot of that gap was coming from briefs that we were getting from brands. And in those briefs were two things. One, our brand's not relevant to millennials. Our customer base is dying off. Mm-hmm. And two, we'd like to you know, be a part of culture in some way. Now, are those challenges that a traditional ad agency can solve? Maybe. But what we wanted to do at the time was think to ourselves like, all right, well, certainly a, a planner or a strategist can talk to the brand about how to be relevant to millennials and we'll do some research and you know, I'm in my mid 40s, I'll get up and talk to them about what the younger generation wants. But that's hypocritical, we felt. We felt that that was hypocritical from 
someone like us getting in front of it. So the original strategy was for millennials by millennials. Okay. Was to have an organization that was people that were, we hired from culture, that we hired from places like fashion, music, art, that aren't necessarily from advertising, mm -hmm. but they're creatives. Sure. And when you think about creativity and you think about building and making and telling a story, it's very close to what advertising agency creatives do. But when you put those two people together, really fascinating things happen. Because it's one thing to develop an ad campaign. It's another to help a brand be a part of culture in a relevant, authentic way. And it was an idea that we had. It was an idea that we pitched Yannick on. He helped us fund it. We built it first in Chicago. And then we bought the 88s in New York, Harry Bernstein, and, and now that's it's called Annex 88s in New York. We've built one in Atlanta, mm -hmm. around mostly around the Coca-Cola business and different brands that we have there. We'll be in LA soon, knock on wood, with a, an acquisition that we're working on. And hopefully in Miami soon, we'll have uh, Annex Cultura, which will be our Latino Annex in, in Miami, which, which will be interesting and cool. So let me try to reframe this. Basically, you're saying a good idea can come from anywhere and let's empower everyone with a good idea, especially those who might be consuming the product that you want to talk about, who might be influencing the product or the brand right. that you're trying to right. market around right. and have everybody collaborate based on all kinds of walks of life. Yeah, that's that's right. The positioning for the annex is consultants of culture. And it, why does that remind me of Sultans of Swing? I, I mean, that's it, okay too. <laughs> I like that. We'll swing for the fences. Okay. We like that positioning because we don't think that consultants can live there. And we don't think that a traditional ad agency can live there. So mm. it's it's interesting white space. And what they do is they help brands tap into the business of culture. And when you think about brands like Adidas mm -hmm. and Coca-Cola mm -hmm. and others that have really been smart about who they work with, how they design their shoes, how the, what music do they use, how do they inject themselves into music, how they into film, yeah. design, th those, those ideas come from people that know those cultures deeply and live in those cultures. They don't come from someone like me who knows about them. And yeah, I like me. I like that kind of music and I certainly wear those shoes, but I'm not in it. I'm not in it. And it's a different thing. Yeah. It's a different thing. And, and so far it's, it's a, you know, three and a half year old, I'd say it's still in startup mode in, in, in many ways. Mm -hmm. And we're hopefully going to relaunch it at Cannes this year and give more meaning around it at can and announce a few things while we're there. Ooh. Yeah. Maybe I'll get to go this year. Yeah, All right. right. I'll look for you on the <laughs> yacht. <laughs> All right. So then we have sort of the the new approach to creative and being non-denominational in, in that development. What is Arcadia? Because is that yeah. sort of like the point counterpoint? That's a good question. So we talk a lot about the challenges that face today's CMOs and today's brands. One of them is to deeply understand how a buyer makes purchase decisions in a category and how they make purchase decisions for that particular brand. Mm -hmm. And what along that particular journey can intercept them, can help inform them, can help them make a decision that you might want them to make along the way. And certainly customer journey maps are nothing new. They've been around as long as I think ad agencies probably have in some way, sense of shape. Mm -hmm. But the model for us is that it's really, it's powered on AI. And, and we've had a long relationship with IBM. We've been a big part of, of w helping Watson, you know, make its moves. And the team in New York, that's the Arcadia development team, realized that a really powerful customer journey has all different types of data. Qualitative, quantitative, first, second, third, how, any type of data you might have. The hardest part about that is, is analyzing that data 
in a in a rapid, you know, speed of yeah today's economy assessment, and then help the strategist and and the human side of it make smart decisions as it relates to where to place investments, where to pull back investment, where that idea that we talked about earlier, how that idea takes shape at different parts of the journey. When you think about high consideration purchase, there's certainly excitement and then there's fear. And then you get into, you know, you can get into the valley on maybe there's some things that we need to do from a creative messaging point of view. That's a little different Mm -hmm. from an awareness point of view when we're at that part of the journey. And it's really been an incredible, it's become the DNA of how we've been developing our creative storylines. And our meaningful brand research plays into that. To us, this is really the DNA of how our idea comes to life for a brand. And it's something that we've been investing in pretty considerably and doubled down on that investment this year. And it's been in stealth mode in some ways <laughs> for us. But it's, it, again, back to having an organization like Havas that will will invest in a good idea and help build that idea. We tend to do more of that than go out and aqu- just acquire big organizations where we're acquisitive for sure, but we're not the most acquisitive organization in the competitive set. So I might be, you know, talking out of my hat here, but is that anything to do with the implications of programmatic creative or no? It could. It, it, it's more of a decision-making tool than it is a creative development tool. We, you know, there are the idea of programmatic creative and assembling creative on the fly is certainly a hot discussion. Yeah. It's it's certainly changed how creative is developed as it relates to developing the idea and then fragments of that idea so that that creative can be delivered on the fly. I love the idea of I call it predictive I call it predictive creative because really? if you can predict if you can predict with a degree of propensity where somebody's at in their decision journey for a purchase, you can influence them at that particular point of purchase, right? So if, you, if you're a retailer and you know because you have the data that if somebody buys a grill at your retail store, that there's a 30% propensity that they'll buy a pergola or an outdoor patio mm-hmm. set from your store in the next 30 days, that will fundamentally change how you market to them post grill purchase. Okay. And, and depending on where they're at in that purchase, you can, you can certainly create either thought experiments or, or paths to per paths to purchase that then your idea gets delivered on those paths on an if then scenario. Mm-hmm. If, if she does this, do the, the creative will do this. If she does that, the creative will do this, depending on where she's at in, in the journey. And so that, that, that to me is super interesting. I'm not, <laughs> I, I'm not the person that's going to say, if we don't develop the 30 second spot where we're not an ad agency, I think a good idea can work in any channel. And, and so even versioning is creative work. It changes it a bit, but but the idea, again, as you get down deeper into the funnel, a really good idea can work if it's done right. Okay. <laughs> but, all right. We're going with that then. <laughs> so I just want to wrap it up with a couple more questions. Given the fact that CMOs are spending less and less time chiefly in marketing. Right. Tools like this are helping them. I know that it's really important to you to be a resource for CMOs. Yeah. And it seems like with Arcadia and the Annex approach and you know breaking down the silos with creatives and all of that should theoretically help them. How has it worked out with you helping CMOs? What's a success story recently? Well, I think when you have a network like ours that has disparate organizations and, and brands. You know, when, when I took over North America two years ago, one of the f- first things that we wanted to do as a team was figure out some clarity around our portfolio. So it was mm-hmm. really a portfolio management approach to say, if you were a CMO of a major brand and you were looking in at our company, how would you see it? What would it look like to you? And we still have work to do, but that was certainly a part of it. So our ambition of being the most meaningful partner to the modern CMO is an idea that creates a wrapper to our capabilities. And we and we won't go into full detail, but we basically categorize it into creativity, culture, and commerce, right? And 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 some of the how some of the best brands are behaving 
they're doing amazing in those three particular categories and maybe mm-hmm. a couple of others, content and community being being two others. I would be remiss if I didn't say that Denise Karkos was just named at age CMO of the year, Go ahead. you know, last <laughs> uh, a week ago. And, uh, and great. she is probably the most deserving CMO in the industry for sure. Yay. I think a big part of that is because of her courage to push her partners, not mm-hmm. just not just Havas, but the other partners that she has, and to really, you know, take a category that TD Ameritrade's in that you would traditionally think is not a fun and sexy category and have some fun with it to make the idea of money accessible. And how do you do that, right? Our green room, our green couch yeah. campaign, uh, the the Bitcoin that we talked about earlier, so many other things that she's doing that that the marketplace sees, but also the things that they don't see. Uh, she is um, hungry for learning. She's super curious. She's she knows that to keep up today is really hard to do mm-hmm. for anybody, whether you're an agency or or a brand, because things change so quickly. And she relies deeply on her partners to do that. And you have to give her a shout out on that. I mean, that's that that we I would like to think we were a small part of that. Yeah, a good enabler. <laughs> yeah. Good. All right. Well, with that, then last question: What are you most bullish on for the near term mm-hmm. and for the long term future of this industry? One thing I know to be true. Okay. Is that you sound cha- like Oprah right now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is that change is the only constant? It really is. I know that sounds really cliche. But that's why I got into this business. And mm-hmm. I'm bullish on the fact that things are going to change. Mm-hmm. And I'm not, I'm not afraid of that. I don't think our organization is afraid of that. And we want to continue to be on the forefront of, of that change. And I still have a lot of runway in my career, I think. <laughs> and, and I get most excited about being able to find new ideas, you know, find things that work, find things that matter to brands and you know, you know, being in an organization like Havas really helps enable and empower that. I, I love that, Paul. And, and whatever that phrase is, walk in the talk or talk in the talk, <laughs> I, you're, you're doing it right, oh, it you. seems. And, and I love this conversation. Thank you Likewise, so much, thank you, Eby. Paul Maribel. My pleasure. I'm E.B. Moss, and you've been listening to Insider Insights for Media Village. Check us out at mediavillage.com, and I hope that you'll subscribe to Insider Insights wherever you listen to podcasts.